UX Podcast is funded by James and myself, together with any contributions we can get from you, our listeners. You can contribute any amount you like, whenever you like, by visiting uxpodcast.com slash support. UX Podcast, episode 218. I'm James Royal Lawson. And I'm Pat Axbaum. And this is UX Podcast, balancing business, technology and people every other Friday from Stockholm, Sweden. With listeners in 188 countries around the world, from Paraguay to the Republic of Ireland. Our guest this episode is Claire Liu. Claire is the CEO of Know Your Team, speaker, teacher and host of The Heartbeat, a podcast about leadership. We met up with Claire earlier in 2019 at UX LX in Lisbon, Portugal, where she had a workshop about feedback, the feedback loop, how to create a culture of feedback. And so we learned from Claire about giving and receiving feedback from the position as a leader, but also a peer, colleague, or in all aspects of life. So Claire, I think, well, personally anyway, I think you're always wanting to receive feedback, but what's the... Can you give me a bit more of that? What's the benefit of feedback? Sure. Well, I think even the assumption that, you know, you're wanting to receive feedback, first of all, I think that's great. Mm. But I also feel like even, you know, starting there, that's not always true. I think, um, you know, there's so much research that's been done about how we don't like to hear the things that we don't like to hear. Mm. So uh, Harvard Business Review actually published this amazing study about how uh, leaders will actually only surround themselves with people who reaffirm their viewpoints and the likelihood that they will actually actively promote and surround themselves with people who have differing viewpoints is is much lower. Um, So anywho, just... I just wanted to sort of assert even there, like, it's amazing that you, no, you feel that way. No, well, I, I completely agree, and I know what you mean. Like, I, I, think, I think you want to, I mean, personally, like, yeah. I'd like to receive feedback. Right. But, yeah, I'm scared, of course, that the feedback might not be... Right, you might not be ready world. for it. Uh, yeah. We're always scared of the things we don't know. Yeah. It's easy to, to you know, it's human. Uh, but to your point, right, so why, why is it important, right, to, to begin with? So first and foremost uh, is blind spots. So, so often for many of us, whether we are running a company, whether we are a manager, whether we're an individual contributor, the things that hurt us the most are the things we don't know. Mm-hmm. It's when we find out uh, unexpectedly that someone thinks a project is going terribly and you're just about to either ship the code or maybe present it to the client, and you're like, wait, what? You think this is bad? You disagree? It's like, ah, that caught me off guard. Or it could be that because of the lack of feedback, you have no idea that a key person on your team is about to leave. That's actually one of the most sort of Mm heart-wrenching, gut-wrenching situations Mm -hmm. is to be blindsided in that case. And then it can be even on a more personal side of not understanding that you actually come off in a certain way or affect the people you work with in a certain way. And so uh, you might realize unexpectedly that you are overbearing Mm. and you come off as controlling to your team. Mm. And that's, you know, that can sort of knock the wind out of you if you've always considered yourself to be a kind and very sort of regimented leader and in fact oh wow i have a really heavy hand Mm. people think i'm micromanaging them i had no idea Mm. so these blind spots uh you know obviously sort of take an emotional toll of it's never fun again to be surprised but from a very practical sense it just means that you as a leader or as an individual contributor can't actually operate and lead or do your work as well (coughs) as you could if you don't have this feedback because of these blind spots or secondly the team actually suffers and Mm. there's worse results because you didn't know about certain decisions or the way people were feeling or people actually leaving and you had Mm. no idea that people were feeling a certain way. So just big (laughs) mistakes and, um, and errors and, and, uh, and hurt that happens because of it. But it's, it's really the blind spots that cause Mm. it. So Mm. that's the importance of feedback and a word blind spots. That actually made me think of an experience I had. This was like, 15 years ago or something Mm. uh, where I went to a a meeting with a colleague and after the meeting uh, this colleague of mine told me that uh, they had felt undermined 
by how I behaved in the meeting because uh, I hadn't agreed with them with everything they'd said. Sure. And I, I, I was so thankful that they had felt that they actually could give that feedback to me. But how do you actually then make sure that people feel confident enough or trust you enough to provide you with that feedback? Absolutely. I mean, that's mm. the hardest mm. thing, right, is y once you f find out that there was something that you didn't know, mm. the big question is, how did I not know earlier? Yeah. Right? And if this person feels this way, how many other people feel this way? And so to your point, then naturally, y you know, you, you try to figure out how do you actually create an environment to for people to feel open and honest about this. And James, I know you sat through the workshop, yeah. so <laughs> yeah, you, you know, you might be rehearing some of some of the points I made there, but there are two key reasons for why people don't tend to speak up at work. So mm -hmm. the first, uh, which is pretty obvious and, and natural, is fear. So oftentimes in especially a work dynamic, there's some sort of power at play, right? So you have someone who is paying another person to get work done. As a result, the likelihood that someone is going to speak up to that person who is paying them, <laughs> mm. Mm, yeah. uh, the trade-off doesn't really seem worth it all the time. Uh, you feel like you are having to speak truth to power, which is really intimidating. You don't really see the immediate benefit. You, know, you don't sort of uh, bite the hand that feeds you, right? So fear is, is definitely at play. But most interestingly, the second reason, and this is actually the biggest reason for why people don't speak up at work, is futility. So this feeling that even if I were to speak up, nothing's going to happen. Right. Nothing's going to change. Yeah. So maybe that person in the meeting never said mm. anything earlier because they thought, mm, no, Pear's not really receptive to mm. feel like he's not going to do anything different or maybe he'll blow up or, you know, it's not going to mm. change the situation. So f futility in studies has been shown to be 1.8 times more powerful than fear as an obstacle to feedback. So, yeah, which oh, is wow. surprising because most uh, leaders actually assume, okay, you know, my team's not speaking up because they're a little scared of me or they're scared mm -hmm. that they're all going to get fired, mm. perhaps, right? Mm. However, it's almost twice the magnitude, right? Uh, futility is as a barrier to feedback, meaning that it's not just that people are scared necessarily, they actually might not even be scared, but they actually aren't speaking up because they don't think you're going to do anything with their feedback, which so goes to show... This is the kind of, yeah. I suppose, it's the cultural side of it too. Yes. But if you've, if you've got management or leaders that are sur surrounding themselves with people who agree with them, um, and then you then maybe have tried to mm -hmm. express some feedback, but they're not open to receiving it. Right. So you feel frustrated because you've already tried to do this. Exactly. And it's not working. Right. So there's no point trying again. Right. And it just reinforces that echo chamber. Yes. So leaders wonder, well, how do I, you know, why, why am I, you know, I try to not surround myself with people who are just telling me the things that I want to hear. But what they don't realize is, well, if you aren't in some way overcoming the sense of futility, which, by the way, doesn't mean that you implement every single person's suggestion. A lot of leaders think, oh, if I try to overcome futility, then as an obstacle to feedback, this means I need to give everyone, you know, a million dollars and just do every little suggestion that people make, even when it's a bad idea. And it's like, no, 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 that's not really what acting on feedback means. That's not what actually listening mm. to feedback means. And that's not what uh, overcoming futility is about. And, you know, I covered this in the workshop. It can be actually as simple as thanking someone mm. right. for their feedback. That's a form of acting on mm. feedback. That's a form of overcoming mm. uh, futility. So I think also the interesting point about, um, you know, this sort of examination that futility is the real driver for why people don't speak up is that it goes to show that the reason for why people give feedback in the first place is because they want something to be different. Mm. We forget that. Mm. We forget that feedback is not just about venting. Mm. It's not just about... I need to get this off my chest. I just want to complain. I just feel like I have to say something. It's not about that. It's like people actually are giving feedback or want to feel give feedback because they want something different to happen. And that's actually, that's pretty special to capture. And as a leader, we should, or as leaders, we should be a little bit, I think, more genuinely curious about figuring out what those things are. If people think things should be different, wouldn't you want to know? Right. Yeah, mm. and harness the enthusiasm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I I, I, f I find that to be um, I find that to be an important reminder because I think in a day and age where feedback is I don't know it's, it's such a cliched word mm. you know there's all these feedback surveys and uh, 
I mean, and you know, myself running a software company, you know, called Know Your Team, and mm. we have you know feedback uh, features, right? In the software, it can be easy just to see it as this thing you check off the box because it is popular. But I, I feel like it is always important for us as, as leaders and as teammates to just remember it's we're doing this because people want things to be better and they mm. want things to be different in some way. Yeah, yeah. There's a risk it becomes a metric. Yes. Uh, rather than a, a, a an actual tool for change. Right, and and you know. Uh, a badge to wear, mm. Mm. right? For companies to say, oh, we're open to feedback. Yeah. Yeah. What does that really mean? Mm. And yeah, well exactly. why, right? Yeah. Oh, you say, oh, we're getting, our leaders mm. get 4.7 right. <laughs> on some kind right. of <laughs> annual survey, a yeah, scale or something. It's, uh, I mean, it makes a mockery of the whole thing. So, p so part of uh, listening to that feedback is interpreting it as well, I guess. Yes. Because, yes, someone wants change, but it's not always the case that they exactly know themselves what change they want, but they're expressing something. They're not satisfied with something that they wanted. So Absolutely. how do you become a better listener? Yes. A lifelong pursuit <laughs> <laughs> for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. No, but you're right. I think uh, oftentimes, you know, the frustration for many of us who receive feedback is you hear the feedback and you go, well, this person is saying this based off incomplete information. This person is saying this because they have their own interests in mind, because they're not seeing the bigger picture. And I think the first part of becoming a better listener to see that bigger picture, to understand that this person even has incomplete information, mm -hmm. right? is to recognize that when you're listening that you're just trying to understand you're not trying to find uh, which, which by the way you know it sounds so obvious it's like mm. yeah that's the point of listening but mm. we we often think of listening as simply the closing of the mouth <laughs> <laughs> instead of a, and the sort of worrying yeah. of the mind it's like mm. when we when we often quote unquote listen, we close the mouth and then our mind just goes in a million places. We go, oh, wow, how could they say that? I'm thinking about, you know, what I need to do later today. I'm thinking about what I'm going to say. I'm trying to end this conversation quickly. I'm just trying to figure out what the to do's like. And that's not really, that's not listening. So listening is first truly seeing your time with that person and, and that time to listen as, uh, you know, seeking to, to understand. So, you know, that's, that's the, f the first step. The second is to assume positive intent in, in actually trying to mm -hmm. understand. Uh, because, and the reason for this is, is it's difficult to really assess what pieces of information people are missing or what, or why someone might be um, coming from a, a different place than you are if you are assuming the worst. If you you're to be defensive from the start. Yeah, mm, yeah, exactly. Like, it's interesting. Defensiveness is truly the result of misconstruing someone's intent. That is where, that is the root of all defensiveness. It's believing that someone has a different purpose than mm. you do. And so if you assume positive intent, if you assume that they have a, some sort of good purpose behind what they're saying, then so much clarity is revealed. And from there, then you can ask a bunch of questions around, okay, well, tell me, tell me, uh, you know, what information you feel like you don't have, or can you explain why, um, you know, this made you feel this way, and then you gain more understanding. But I think the first two things of really choosing to, to you know, I call it, I say often, you know, making empathy your mission, right? Mm -hmm. um, this being the first step, and then assuming assuming positive intent um, is a second. And then, and then I guess the last thing I'll add is <laughs> uh, I think a huge part of listening is just, and listening well, is resisting your own reaction to say something more and just actually talking less. Yeah. You can't be a good listener if you're talking. Mm. It's that simple. So just finding ways to talk less and... Uh, and, and yeah, and, and that allows the other person to, to share more of what's in their mind. Mm. So would you consider it important for everyone uh, in the company or on a team to learn about these skills? Because sometimes I can feel like yeah. somebody learns the skills, the other person doesn't. And it's, <laughs> like it's sort of like you're gaming the other person because totally. you, you, there's an imbalance, the magic power. There's yeah. an imbalance <laughs> in, the, in the communication power. Yeah. 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 You know... 
Absolutely, right? I mean, it goes for any skill set, whether mm. you're teaching decision making, whether you're teaching mm. um, collaboration, right? It's uh, not useful for just sort of one person, or it doesn't really work either, mm. right? If one person is the only one sort of equipped with, with knowledge or tactics, et cetera. However, what I will say is I do think you know, and it's funny, like we, you know, I run a software company that is all about teaching leaders to be better. And I give workshops to leaders and individual contributors all over the world on this topic. But mm. I also believe as much as sort of that, um, those steps of, you know, education are important, that people learn by example. Mm. <laughs> yes. Right. Like if you sort of reflect on the f your most favorite boss or mentor or person you look up to, you notice probably, likely, this is true for myself and for a lot of leaders that we work with, yourself emulating the things that you really appreciated about what they did. Uh, you know, for example, uh, I have uh, an amazing mentor who's, you know, a, a CEO of a 600 plus, you know, software company. And she, she could not be a more direct human being, my goodness, in the best way. Just like, no bullshit. Like, so refreshing. <laughs> And uh, I, I try hard to emulate that, right? I, I, I draw a lot of inspiration. For, like, I, she, she didn't set, sit me down and go, okay, Claire, here's, you know, here's the manual on straight talk, or I'm going to go send <laughs> you to a, a coach on communication skills, or you should take this workshop or read this book. It's like, you'd, I think there's a huge sort of opportunity and, uh, and almost an obligation we have as leaders to remember that, our actions speak louder than words, yes, mm -hmm. cliche there, but, but truly, and that people are, are going to emulate and look to us for what we see as acceptable behavior and what we see as sort of mm -hmm. also ideal behavior. So I think, um, you know, how do you sort of teach people, right? Uh, yeah. If, you know, let's say you came out of my workshop and you're like, oh, you know, you have the packet and you have the slides, and you're like, hey, this is great. You know, how do I get my team to do this? It's like, yes, of course, you can bring us in, do a workshop, et cetera. You can use our tool, all that good stuff. But I think even more just demonstrating that, you know, the kinds of questions you ask, the way you actually act on feedback, the mm. way you even talk about feedback mm. says a lot. So, so that's probably a good point to then ask. It's like, how, how do I ask for, for feedback? Because right. if we're coming from that, I mean, I yes. guess that's the natural starting point, that if, if people aren't giving or aren't trained to kind of give good feedback, then right. you are the one who's now got this ability to <laughs> elicit uh, um, feedback so mm. asking is going to be the the first step yes asking is is the first step and there's several several techniques right that are are really effective for asking for feedback well uh the first is around what i i like to call going first mm. uh and it's this idea that if fear is a big obstacle to why people don't speak up you have to create a safe space them to speak up. A lot of studies done on the importance of psychological safety in the workplace. Google mm. most famously um, with their, I believe, Project Aristotle that they did uh, maybe five plus years ago around psychological safety being uh, the most sort of definitive aspect of successful teams, right? So as a leader, okay, I got to make the environment safe. But how do you do that with questions? So how do you do that in asking for feedback? So uh, like I was saying, I like to call it going first, which is as a leader, you simply have to go first and reveal more if you want others to reveal something to you. So a way to do that and to create this vulnerability is to ask for advice instead of for feedback, right? Advice, right. so much more inviting. Mm. Everyone loves giving advice, mm. feedback, that word. <laughs> People mm. sort of cringe, mm. they assume it's negative, no one likes to give feedback. Mm. So you make things vulnerable by saying, hey, I want your advice, I'm seeking your opinion, you're mm. the expert here. It changes the power dynamic, yes. it changes mm. the element mm. of fear all in that one word, yeah. advice, mm. right? Another way to go first is to simply admit what you're struggling with. It's amazing as a leader how much feedback you'll get when you just say to someone, I'm actually just having a hard time figuring this out. Can you help me? Mm. What's your opinion? Mm. How would you do this, right? I just need some help. Mm. And so just admitting what you're struggling with is, is key. Um, and then another way of, um, other than going first, of, of asking for specific feedback is, uh, well, to ask specific questions, right? So a lot of times the reason the feedback that we don't or that we get is 
not very helpful or super vague and generalized is because the questions that we're asking are, are also quite vague and generalized. So sort of favorite all-time question I think for most people is, you know, you sit down with your one-on-one and it's natural. You just say, how's it going? Mm-hmm. We've all asked, yeah, asked the vague, that. The vague, yeah. broad open yeah, questions, how's it going? how are we going? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Do we ever answer anything other than fine or no. okay or good? Mm-hmm. Like, rarely. Sometimes you'll get a good answer. I've got a lot on my plate right now. Yeah. That's the standard response. Exactly. Like, <laughs> but very rarely. Like, no one's going to tell you, how's it going? Oh, well, it's going pretty well, but I'm actually really, you know, stuck on this particular issue, and I would love your help and feedback on, on, on you know, getting into this decision. And it's like, no one's ever going to say that. So mm-hmm. instead of asking, you know, how's it going, you can... Uh, ask so many more specific questions and one way to do this is to simply ask about one thing instead of just saying how's it going so for example you know what's you know one thing that could have been better in the past month what's one Mm -hmm. thing that you would have liked to see different in the past meeting one thing it's an easy way to make the question more specific another way to make questions more specific is to do what i call time boxing so uh, another sort of really vague general question that a lot of people like to ask is um uh, what can we improve? Mm. Mm. What, what, or what would you like to see different? Mm. It's like, a, a, like when, like in regards to what, right? Mm. And so instead you could say, is there anything in the last, or what in the last, you know, month do you think could have been better, right? Or, um, you know, what in the past two weeks um, would you have liked to see in different, right? So time boxing the question. And then the last way um, that I always recommend around asking better questions to get good feedback uh, is to ask questions around moments of tension and moments of energy. So what this means is that people feel tense or they feel upset or they feel frustrated, right, about past things, but we often don't zone in on what those moments are. So we never really know what it is that's making someone stressed out. We never really know why someone doesn't feel motivated. And the same thing for positive um, sensations. So it's like, okay, if someone's feeling happy or proud, great. But like, is that just sort of how they're feeling like today on a Tuesday or because they had a really good Mm -hmm. lunch or is it like because of a specific project? So Mm -hmm. to ask questions about those specific moments. So instead of just asking, are you motivated? Mm -hmm. It's to ask, when have you been motivated Mm -hmm. in the past year? huge difference in those two questions you ask are you motivated and people just can easily say yes no Mm -hmm. and then some vague reason as to why you ask someone when they were motivated and they go huh you know there was this project i was working on six Mm -hmm. months ago and it was with this person and it was because it was around this topic that's such a much more rich interesting answer that you're going to learn from uh so you know, just asking when, so specific moments of tension mm-hmm. energy. So when have you been frustrated? When have you been annoyed? Uh, when have you been bored in your work? Mm-hmm. And then moments of energy, when have you been excited? When have you felt proud of the work that you've done? And then you're actually helping that person find the response. Exactly. Which instantly makes them feel better right. just by being able to articulate it. Yes. <laughs> it's not even that you have to fix it. It's just, I helped you understand something about yourself. Right. And it's mm. literal and concrete. Mm-hmm. It's not yeah. just this like sort of, because sometimes we feel a certain way about work. You're just kind of like, ah, it's just kind of flat and stuck. Mm. And so if you're talking to your boss about that or you're, they're like, oh, how's work going? They're like, you know, things are pretty okay. And it's like, well, okay. Well, why is that? Well, I don't really, I don't know. It's, you know, you're not helping that person figure out what, what sort of that root cause is. But if you ask when, well, when, when, when is a time when you, when you really felt this way? Huh. You know what? It was when we had this meeting with the client and they kind of blew up at us and et cetera, right? Mm. So uh, it's amazing what the power of a, of a really mm. well-done question can, mm. can do. So I was wondering, though, yeah, I mean, a, l- a lot of us um, maybe aren't leaders, or we don't have kind of responsibility over um, colleagues. But instead, we you know we we work with peers and we work in teams. Yes. So what what can I do as a as a as a team member or uh, one amongst peers to do to to elicit feedback and give feedback? Absolutely. So the uh, the power of asking 
you know, these vulnerable questions, right, and going first, the power of specific questions and questions around uh, moments of tension and energy, that definitely still stands. Uh, the most important thing, though, from an individual contributor perspective to share, though, is, and this is the thing that gets most sort of lost in the weeds, either when you're giving feedback or asking for feedback, is to explain your intention mm. behind it. So, mm. you know, we've been talking a lot about intention mm. today, but uh, a lot of miscommunication or misconstruing of why teammates give feedback in a certain way or why they're asking certain questions happens because we don't really understand why people are asking or why people are giving this, this feedback. And so especially as an individual contributor, if you are giving feedback upwards or you're asking for feedback from your boss, it's to explain why. Here's why I'm giving. It's because I want to progress in my career and I'm trying to learn as much about how I can improve my own skill set or I'm asking this because I think our team could be better and I really want to get those varied perspectives so mm. we can we can make progress or I'm giving this feedback because I really care about the team's culture um, and, and want everyone to have as great of an experience as I did right so uh, I think it's it's easy just to assume that that comes through uh, but I think sort of the greatest advice I have for individual contributors around feedback is don't forget to explain mm why yeah. you want it or why you're giving it or why you're asking for it. Mm. I'm actually working on a tool for uh, evaluating someone's health online. Oh, excellent. I've been looking at different tools. And the best one I've found is NHS in the UK mm -hmm. because their tool ask actually explains why they're asking that particular question. <laughs> right. Th and then I understand yes. why, I have to wha why they're asking it so I understand why I have to respond to it. But otherwise yes. there's just a, a barrage of questions and I, oh, there's so many questions. Why are they even asking this? Right. And I start to question the validity of the tool. Right. And I don't trust it as much. Or even try to work out what yeah. you're trying yeah. to, the, um, the hidden the hidden reason. Mm. Yeah. You, know, you see a question, you think, oh, all yeah. right, I yeah. know what they're getting at. Trying I'm to figure it out. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I'm going to give that answer. He's trying to game the system. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Mm. I, I think that mm. is so mm. true. Mm. And, you know, I share this and then I think, well, it's likely almost equally important from from sort of a leadership side. It doesn't mean that you never, you know, as, as leaders that we never <laughs> should explain why we're asking for mm. feedback. Mm. I mean, to your point, people like to know why things are, are happening. I mean, that, that could not be a more sort of baseline sort of human instinct that we have is we like things to make sense. Mm. Things don't make sense unless we explain things. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny. It's funny how that, that happens. Mm, yeah. So, th yeah, th all of this we can use and uh, to to create a culture um, of feedback, um, not well in our teens upwards and downwards. I mean, it's 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 really universally applicable, even in our non-work lives. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's funny because you know the software company that I run is you know it's called Know Your Team, but we'll we will literally get emails from people saying, "Do you have a Know Your Spouse?" Yeah, player? Know Your Wife or Know Your Husband <laughs> or yeah. uh, Know Your Know yeah. Your Family, and it's true. Mm. It's because if feedback is simply about sharing what we would like to see that's better or different, that application, mm. th yeah, that application is true in not just work teams, but in our communities, in our government, in mm. our social lives, in our romantic lives. Mm. It's sort of ever, ever present. Uh, I also think, and this is the reason I've always been so passionate about this topic, I think though deeply, and the reason why I've chosen to focus specifically on in our work lives is because <laughs> the amount of frustration that happens and the amount of cost that happens in our workplaces because we don't know how to give this feedback well or ask for it well sort of reverberates outward. It's mm. like if you're less happy at work and if the company isn't also that you're working for performing well, it's like, okay, your livelihood, you know, the, mm. the uh, uh, sort of positive potential there goes down. And then just how you're able to... Uh, go about your life right like you come home you talk to your family and you're in a miserable sort of state of mind because ugh, like my boss won't listen to me mm -hmm. and here's the thing that that was me mm -hmm. eight nine years ago mm -hmm. you know yeah. i started this company because i had a boss and worked in a company where i felt like wow th there's no culture of feedback and uh 
you know, the CEO of the time, great person, but has no idea what his employees actually think. And mm. it blew my mind. It was a very small company too. Mm. Um, and so that's what inspired, you know, this, mm. this whole, whole journey. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's true in, in so many different mm. aspects of, of life in general. So it can benefit your complete life. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful message to our listen- listeners. I hope Th- so. Thank you, Claire, for sitting down with us. Thank you, Claire. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. For me, this was a hugely important show to listen back to because it has all these good techniques and tips for just reminding yourself on how to give feedback, how to receive feedback, things that you tend to forget because you may know that it's really important, but it's always so easy to go. Like, except for example, if someone wants to give you feedback, it's so easy to go into defensive mode and not think that the person who is giving you feedback has positive intent. You think they're sort of undermining you. That's the sort of feeling you get. But you always have to remind yourself that people give feedback because they want to change something. They want something to be different and hopefully better as well. And so there's always, always something to learn from the p- feedback. And you just need to be vulnerable enough and show yourself vulnerable enough to actually receive it in a good way. I think Learn how to listen. Exactly. I think we've all been in those mm. m- situations where a person of authority um, has closed us down when we've tried um, expressing um, mm. something or some giving some feedback. Um, that's Which means that it's so much harder for them to get feedback at a p- point in the future because you'll just give up. Because you think it's futile. Mm. Yeah, exactly. You've not been heard. You've not been listened mm. to. Mm. So your enthusiasm to actually try diminishes. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And you reinforce a culture. That's, I mean, that w- has to be one of the biggest problems in, in big corporations today is that people don't dare speak up. They don't dare voice their concerns, mm. uh, raise their hand and say that I think something is off here. I would like it to be different. And sometimes they need help. I mean, because that's also another problem I, d- I just thought about is that people try to give feedback, but they're not, they're not sure what that the feedback they want to give is. They just have a bad feeling. And then the person listening thinks, oh, well, you can't spec- be specific about what your feedback, then I won't listen to it. But instead, you should be digging further and helping them to express themselves and all the wonderful techniques that Claire uh, gave us with specifying when in time uh, uh, did you have this feeling? Uh, what's one thing that could be better? Uh, so all those uh, techniques for asking specific questions, really, really Yeah, good. make sure you've got those mm-hmm. um, um, exploratory tools um, oh, to, to, to dig deeper, to, to mm. continue the conversation. Um, yeah. Because it is a conversation. It's giving and yeah. receiving feedback. Exactly. She, um, we, we, we covered a lot of aspects. In, in, in um, Claire's workshop, um, then it was split into four parts. Mm-hmm. Asking, acting, giving, and receiving. Um, and I think we did cover asking. Um, we covered acting. And we also covered receiving in the podcast now. Um, yeah, well, there was a sort of like creating the culture for getting feedback, asking for advice, advice, admitting what you're struggling with. But I'm sure there are some aspects of how to be better at not jumping to conclusions about the feedback, but actually just instead of responding, asking further questions to get to the bottom of what that person is trying to express. Mm. Yeah, and also an aspect of re- receiving is um, Claire gave the tip during the workshop about um, not only li- um, the silence, making sure you are listening, mm. she also recommended that you write things down because that, yeah. that helps you be silent but also helps you mm. um, take on board um, the feedback that you're receiving. That's, that's really interesting because that's something that we practiced during when I studied coaching is not to write things down ah. because it... it, it shows the person that you're paying attention to something else. So get uh, maintaining a relationship and that rapport with a person, eye contact is really important. So you, you mustn't forget that either. I think. When is the, 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 um, mm-hmm. the advice there then is, I suppose for coaching, is that you would, you would write down directly after, wouldn't you? Exactly, right. yes. Okay. Mm. Interesting. So I mean, I, yeah, that's mm. interesting. The reflection. Like, silence is good. Writing down mm-hmm. as a tool for silence may be perhaps mm-hmm. not always recommended, but writing down definitely. Mm-hmm choose, a, choose yeah. the right time because there are things you could miss in the other person's expression or body language if you're paying attention to something yeah, else completely true 
Um, and then the, giving feedback, that, that definitely an area we didn't cover so much in the, the mm. podcast, I think. But um, um, during Claire's workshop, she, um, she had four techniques, which um, are quite useful. Um, w- one of them in particular, the first one she mentioned, was make sure you come from a place of care. So she, she recommended mm. or highlighted that you need to make your intentions clear that, you know, I, I'm saying this because I care, basically. So you're, you're fronting the conversation with something that shows that you're not doing this to, to kind of get them fired or to kind of like, you know, irritate them, get revenge or whatever. I mean, I don't know, pick your, pick your crazy reason. Mm-hmm. Um, you're doing it because you actually want to make a positive difference. So you, like you said about positive yeah. intent for receiving, the positive intent has to be there for, um, for, for giving as well. Exactly. Yeah. Um, there's also like that. observation that you, you've you've spotted this. So be clear that it's it's what you've noticed. Um, so mm. it might be wrong, and then asking mm. them what they think when you've when you've given that kind of um, single sourced um, observational feedback. You know, what does the person who you've given the feedback to think? Um, how do they respond? Yeah. So you you have a conversation about it, and that's the feedback loop, I guess. Probably yes. I, I mean, again, we always talk about the many skills that we as UXers have to have, but I'd argue that this is certainly one of the most important skills mm. because you're getting feedback and giving feedback all the time. It's, I mean, it's, it's a core part of your job. Yeah. Uh, the problem, of course, is, and I think you touched upon it uh, during the interview, is how do you make sure the culture is there? Mm. Because, I mean, if the company or the leaders or the managers aren't even willing to confess that this is really important or uh, acknowledge that it's important, the culture is never going to grow. Mm. I mean, is there, I mean, is there a, even a possibility for you to lead by example uh, from below and make sure that, yeah, people love getting and receiving feedback in, in this team, but if, if it's not part of the culture of the company, how, how do you yeah. get there? I mean, it's a, sp- it's really it's, yeah, and it's a spiral in both ways, isn't it? I mean, if you, mm. if you, um, you know, don't have this feedback um, uh, culture and you, you do have situations where you close people down or you don't listen, then it's a, it's a spiral because the futility increases. Yeah. People don't want to give feedback. So I suppose mm. no matter at what level you're opening yourself up for feedback and um, sharing feedback, you're going to start a positive spiral of, of feedback, perhaps within a culture that isn't so used to feedback. And that's a good thing. Exactly. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know that many of us work with um, you know teams or scrum teams or agile teams of some kind and uh, one of the tools in that is of course retrospectives where uh, exactly, at the yes. end of each mm. sprint you um, mm. you, you know, reflect on the previous sprint and see what mm. could be what, what worked well and what could be changed mm. for the better next time um, mm. and I've, I've reflected on that too that that's that's a good that is a good tool um, but it's very it's very team based it's focusing on the team and the sprint yeah and it lacks individual feedback. Yes. It's, it's rare that individual feedback comes up in those kind of... Sometimes you get kind of praise for like, you know, Pear did a really mm. good job with that. Excellent. Mm. Um, but um, I was thinking about kind of like regular one-on-one feedback is something that's, mm. that's I, f- I feel anyway, missing in those kind of environments yeah. often. I've worked in one, one project my whole life where the product owner actually had regular one-to-one meetings with team members. Yeah. And that was... One of the best projects, obviously. That yeah, I but, oh, but, but <laughs> I mean, I can understand though why that's difficult because, mm. as, as um, you know, the time investment for that, mm. it, you know, you've got to convince yourself it's a good thing. Might be dif- exactly. a difficult step to yeah. take. Um, mm. But I know one thing I was going to try. I've, I've been mm. trying to kind of do, but you know, the summer's got in the way for us. Um, but I, I, I'm going to try and uh, more often with my team uh, members and and peers, um, just ask them maybe every now and then how it's been to work with me during a certain period of time. That's a good one. I like um, that, yeah. You know, to open up that possibility for them to mm. say, well, James, yeah. you know, I just wish you wouldn't talk all the time. <laughs> for example. <laughs> <laughs> and why are you always putting on UX podcast when we're working? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Live speaker system across the entire building. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Pa. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening. Always a pleasure. And a quick reminder, you can contribute to funding UX Podcast by visiting uxpodcast.com slash support. Yeah, and recommended listening after this. Uh, we're going to go for episode 110, UX Coaching, with the wonderful Whitney Hess. Nice. I haven't thought about that one for a while. Remember to keep moving. See you on the other side. <laughs>